Talk about marketing. How have you guys marketed in the beginning? And then what are you doing now? And then if someone was to give you a million dollars and you were told to spend that on marketing, how would you do that? Marketing for us right now has been very limited. Uh, it's literally me. It's, you know, um, on LinkedIn, it's me doing the social media. So it's not as good as it could be. And I'll be the first one to say that, you know, like it's, we could definitely have a marketing team that can make this even better. Uh, what has really helped for us is, you know, going to these conferences where, you know, vacation rental managers uh, in the short-term rental industry are going and, and making these connections and, and really partnering with people um, and, and getting an opportunity to kind of showcase our service. And I think the fact that we've been able to be so persistent and consistent with our service, because if we were not doing a good job, then people would, you know, uh, wouldn't be signing up and staying on. So it's the fact that we're doing what we're saying we're doing and we're continuing doing, continuing doing it, that it's giving people more and more confidence because it's like, all right, well, if they're helping them in this market, they're going to help me. And so now it's getting to a point now with our brand and, and the marketing that we're doing is that it's now kind of speaking for ourselves. At first it was like me, Alex Shapiro, you know, if I didn't do the call, if I didn't do the, the push or the, the, you know, it, it wouldn't happen. And now it's like, we're getting inquiries all the time. Like we've gotten articles written on us from the business insider, you know, like I said, the Inc 5000. So there's, it's getting out there um, naturally, you know, so, which is super nice. If we got a million dollars and how we would do in marketing, you know, I think doing like TV ads, uh, radio ads, as much as we go after the short-term rental industry right now, like a hundred percent of my effort probably goes after short-term rental uh, industry. It's 80, 20 split of 80% short-term rentals, 20% homeowners. So it's telling you that even though hundred percent of my efforts go after short-term rentals, I'm still getting 20% of homeowners because we are at these properties so consistent that homeowners see it. What's that neighbor taking that? Who's taking that can to the curb? Who's all, why are all these cars going there? And they like start, you know, questioning. And then they go over there, talk to the neighbor. The neighbor says, can drug lucky. drop offs. <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Taking the cans to the curb. Like what the hell? And so, and then they get jealous. They're like, well, I gotta take my can to the curb. I don't want to do that. And so then they sign up. And so our churn rate with homeowners is like less than 1%. It's like less than, once you get someone to take your can to the curb, you, you don't go back to take your can to the curb. Um, so it's like, once you sign up, like you're not going back to it. And and so we've been able to just build it from word of mouth, from referrals, from people saying, oh my God, you gotta try this, you know, uh, this company. Uh, a lot of it now is also like, elderly adults, you know, paying for their parents that are like 75, 80 in different states. All the, you know, they live on uh, when it was winter time and the snow and they don't want them to slip on the driveway or whatever it may be. There now is a solution for them. Like before there was no solution. Like if you didn't have cleaners like you do at your you know, property, it, there, there's not really a lot of solutions like that. So if you're in a situation where it's a dire situation because, you know, you don't want your grandmother to slip and fall, uh, then here comes Cam Monkey, you know, for forty nine dollars a month, saving the day. Mm -hmm. For that's it, forty nine dollars a month. Forty nine dollars is what we're starting at for one trash, one recycling can. So our prices go up if you have like multiple. Tr like some of these Airbnbs have like five, six trash cans. Um, you know, some of them are like on super long hills. Like think about Camelback Mountain. So there oh, might be an additional like five dollars charge here and there, but for the most part, yes, yeah, starts at forty nine dollars per property. That's awesome. Talk to me about the other services that you're looking to integrate. So right now we have our on-demand trash removal. Uh, we're at the property so often that we're able to track it, what's going on. Sometimes there's bags on the ground um, after a large stay. Some Airbnbs only have one trash can. They overflow. So when we're there, we take photos. Uh, you get real-time notifications on our client dashboard. So we'll let you know, hey, Jesse, uh, this property has extra trash on the ground. Would you like us to remove this for you? You say yes. We'll go send another team out there and remove all the trash bags for you. Uh, we also offer monthly or quarterly can cleaning subscription. Some of these cans get really stinky, uh, especially like in our markets in Florida where, you know, people are cooking fish and, you know, it's hot and mold, you know, uh, it gets really stinky. So, you know, I think when you're, you, you have an Airbnb and you're, you're more like a hotel now, uh, every little thing kind of matters. And so, you know, trash is something that they're touching. Um, you know, some people get judged on everything and some people complain about everything. Like we, you know, we see it. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things that, if it, you know, we're just trying to be your one-stop shop for all your trash solutions. And so here in, uh, in the Phoenix market, we're, you know, dabbling into maybe helping out, you know, some hosts and owners with some other, 
um, household, you know, tasks. Maybe like, you know, they might need um, an inspection, you know, a pre-guest inspection. Maybe they have a back-to-back. -back. Uh, maybe they, the house has been sat, you know, um, vacant for a week and they just want to make sure that the lights and the, the code still works. And so we're starting to get into this like little, like, um, like not handyman, like task rabbit stuff, but a little bit like, hey, we already have a route going. You know, if there's something we can stop by, you know, sometimes they get asked us to like put packages in, like, hey, there's a package at my front door. Can you put it in my garage? So we're just trying this out and seeing maybe we could do something along those lines where since we already have can runners going to routes, maybe we can say, hey, Jesse, when you're at this property, you put that you know, package in the garage, we'll give you an extra $5. You know, and they're like, oh, I'll do that. And then now we just, the, the client's paying us 15 uh, you know, so how do we add other services and take, not take advantage, but take advantage of the fact that we're already at these properties sometimes 16 times a month. How do we take advantage of those routes that we already have operational? And so that's something that we're kind of trying out, but really, um, I'm a big believer, and this is from my real estate background, like, you know, your one, the one thing. So like my one thing is cam monkey. That's my one thing. If I wasn't good at cam monkey, it wouldn't get my foot in the door into other opportunities. Um, like if I wanted to, uh, do on demand. Like, there's junk removal companies all over the place. I'd be a dime a dozen, but there's no other can run, no can monkeys. So like, that's my one thing that now lets me do other things. Um, but you don't have to have your one thing and get to be an expert at it. And that is what I stay true at. And especially in the beginning when we weren't like making any money, my business partner and I, we didn't make any money for the first like three, three or four years. And just to put in something and put in something so much. So, you know, to get to the point where it's at now, um, you have to focus on that one thing because I could have been like, okay, screw this. It's not making me any money. I'm going back into life insurance or I'm going back in title and escrow. But I just stayed true to that one thing. And you, that's what I'm saying like earlier, like now there's light at the end of the tunnel. Like now I'm not crazy. I'm, I'm so guilty of having that. Like I got something going. I'm like, okay, this is going. And I see something else. Oh, yeah. you know, the, the girl in the red dress. Oh, what's that? I like that right, over there. Right. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, shoot, now I'm letting this down, and then I'm doing everything average. And so it's so important, especially as an entrepreneur who's, you know, just starting out. Once you figure it out, like, I think there's shiny object syndrome, I think, kind of has a couple different meanings. I think when people just get started, shiny object syndrome is normal. Go throw everything at the wall and see what you like, see what sticks. But then once you pick something and you're getting some traction, don't get distracted by everything else out there because there's going to be so many distractions. Once someone sees you being successful, they're like, oh, I want to partner with this one. Here's opportunity. Here's opportunity. Here's opportunity. And I'm sure you saw that. So I love that you mentioned that book. And um, it is so true. 